Service Provider Summit this year is, uh, and actually every year, it's really a place where the service providers can come together in a non-threatening environment to talk about the issues that affect them. So typically when you go to a conference like this, uh, OFC and FOEC, you, know, you have a lot of vendors there, they want to spend a lot of time with the uh, carriers, and with service providers, and everything else, but SPS is really their, their place to be able to go and deal with their peers in an, in an area where they don't have to worry about vendors coming up and asking questions and everything else and get to the meaty, nitty gritty details of, a, of an issue that's affecting them. Uh, this year we're specifically looking at cloud computing is one of the big areas. Um, the keynote there is a guy named Joe Weinman who's an industry luminary, been around for a long time at AT&T, uh, now at Telex, and uh, he's coined this phrase called cloud economics or cloudnomics he calls it which looks at cloud computing from a perspective of the service provider or the carrier and how to basically provide that set of service in a very cost effective economical way yet on the same side be able to go and deliver the right set of service value for the end user, the enterprise so they get a good experience at the same time as getting a cost effective solution. So that's really what that's all about. So it should be pretty provocative set, pretty should be a pretty provocative session with him doing his talk in the area as part of the keynote. We also have two panels. Um, the first one looks at the network and you know today people that are doing networks today look at doing pipes um, and the providers look at them, when I say providers meaning content providers, look at them as being just big fat pipes and they want to deliver their content on top. What the service providers want to do is, be do is deliver more of those services. So what they want to be able to do is obviously figure out how to go and add more value, but not necessarily take away from the value that they on, on the, over the top or other content providers are also adding to the network. So how do they get more value of what they put together for their infrastructure today than what they have done historically? The second panel deals with mar uh, merger and acquisitions and what is going on historically in the last two or three years, but also today, the macroeconomic conditions today, are they ripe for continuing to see mergers and acquisitions? And what's the value of those to the carriers? Are they getting more efficiency by acquiring a second and a third company to go and make a bigger company? Or are they just taking competition out in order to increase their margins? So it's going to be pretty provocative as well to go and have different views from carriers like Level 3, et cetera, and what they're doing in the way of M&A and uh, the impact that uh, it brings to them from a value-add standpoint. So in general, and I think as well for service providers, the, the big things that are going right now that people, people talk about, um, you know, example right now, 100 gig. Uh, deployments are now starting today at 100 gig. Um, but most of those are not based on, on cost effectiveness. They're based on other types of, of issues as to why people are deploying 100 gig today. The question for like 2013 uh, is, will 100 gig be on more of an elastic demand curve when it comes to pricing, meaning if the pricing is down low enough, I'm going to have you know, huge amounts of volume occur versus today, small amounts of volume are occurring because I just need to have it as opposed to it's cost effective today. So the, the price elasticity curve and how, they, how 100 gig will, will work according to that price elasticity curve, will that occur in 2013 or will it have to occur in 2014 or beyond? Like 10 gig today has been on an elastic price curve for the last four to five years. So that's a good question. And obviously, the, I would say the, the very first models you see today that have been deployed by uh, the major providers that are doing it today, that's all the ones that do it today, those modules have been deployed for long haul applications. And, and for long haul, 100 gig coherent is very, very cost effective with the new pricing that's going to occur, I think, in 2013. Um, does that same technology work scale-wise in, in Metro? Um, the answer is probably not. Um, but there, there, there's, a, there's a question about what happens in the metro space. When I, when I say that, there's a new technology, we're talking about like 4x25 and 4x28, which is a, a lower cost means to go and do metro 100 gig, which is not compatible with what people are doing in coherent. But if you basically try and take and segment the market for metro into two types of technology, one from let's say 25, uh, 25 by 4, 20, 28x4, and one that's coherent trying to go after that same market, the volume for each one of those is going to be very, very small. Therefore, neither of those technologies are going to become very, very cost effective. So fragmenting the market like that is not the best thing to go off and do. 
So, so the quick answer would be coherent needs to look at ways to go and be more cost effective so they can be deployed in the metro and, and be a cost effective alternative compared to 4x25 or 4x28 and make sure that it becomes the de facto standard for metro. But the current chips that are there today probably not going to be make it because of the cost associated with those, chi those chipsets. I think um, software-defined networking and virtual networks, right? I mean, those are going to be continuing to, to talk about big things, what's going to happen with those. Um, the thing on SDN, software-defined networks, is what's the right, you know, arbitration or orchestration uh, language to use there, right? OpenFlow right now is the first thing people are, are starting to go off and use, but OpenFlow doesn't really scale to be very, very large networks. It works great for small networks. Can it really scale to be in a large network? I don't think that's going to be that case. So what else is going to come along that's going to be a replacement for OpenFlow when a guy like a Verizon or an AT&T wants to try and deploy an SDN network compared to what a Google does, which has been announced today, or somebody else, which is more of a, 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 a I'm not going to say smaller network, but, but more of a private network, let's say, than, than, uh, than what you have with an AT&T or Verizon type of network, or a Deutsche Telekom or somebody else over in Europe, et cetera. Well, that'll be a thing. Um, people, you know, look at things like big data and big data analytics, and is that going to be really a, a, a big deal? Uh, we have, have actually talked about that in the Surf Spider Summit. Can you really get something out of that to get any value out of that from a carrier's perspective, right? Don't know if that's going to really be the case or not. We'll have to see what happens in 2013 on big data analytics if they actually take off and become valuable to help surf providers be able to get more money and more value out of their networks than they have today uh, as part of that thing. Um, other things, um, coherent technology, 400 gig, is it better to do 4 by 100 gig or 5 by 100 gig uh, super channels versus doing a single channel QAM-based 400 gig implementation? There's trade-offs on each of those cases, right? One is traditional technology, maybe a little more cost-effective, you're using up four channels that are tightly spaced versus a single channel, but QAM will not run as far as PMQPSK that has super channel. So you have those trade-offs there of regens versus non-regens and running many, many channels versus small number of channels to get to the same kind of bandwidth. So lots of things in that area. Um, I could go on, there's just lots of stuff.